I'm going to begin with a short prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, and set our hearts ablaze with the fire of your love. Amen. Oh, I wish I could be with you. I wish I could be with you. I know that from a selfish point of view, I would be so uplifted and encouraged by your enthusiasm and your joy in the gospel that the Anglicans of Blaise Conference inspires every time. I remember in 2014 when I was with you, I looked uh, with you at uh, John chapter 13 and we talked about washing feet and then we washed feet. And that sense of the presence of Christ was so powerful. We're called to be those who serve each other, who wash each other's feet, who don't operate in pride. And it's for that that you're all gathered together to pray, to support, to encourage one another, to build and share your discipleship. These are truly wonderful things. Joining with the work of the Spirit who brings life to God's church. The church without the Spirit, well, is just a desert. It's a bunch of rules. And in a moment, I'm going to look at John chapter 7. If you have a Bible or access to one, you may like to have it open in front of you. And I'm going to say that we don't preach morality. Whoops, you say, hang on, I thought we were meant to be quite careful about morality. Good people. Of course we are. We'll come to that. But we don't preach morality because that's when we turn dry. We preach Jesus Christ. And it is the living water of the Spirit, it is the fire of the Spirit <clears throat> that purges our hearts and our minds, that quenches our thirst, that meets our deepest desires. For to be a Christian is to find the whole direction of our desires changed bit by bit until we are in the presence of Christ at the end of time and our de desires are fully satisfied by joy and delight beyond any possible description or imagining. Over the summer, as I just said, I've been reading John's Gospel uh, together with some commentaries. And at the moment, and for some time past, I've been meditating on the seventh chapter, John chapter seven. It's a fairly simple situation. At the beginning of John chapter seven, the Feast of the Tabernacles is coming up in Jerusalem. That's the time when the uh, Jewish people went on pilgrimage to Jerusalem for a festival. It was a sort of harvest time festival and they built booths with branches to remind themselves that they once lived and camped, moving from place to place, and God delivered them into Israel, into this land of milk and honey, as they keep saying. And having reminded themselves, they celebrate, they delight, they rejoice. It's a feast of thanksgiving. And in John chapter 6, the antagonism between Jesus and various of the leaders of Israel had grown and grown. And so Jesus withdraws north a few days' journey on foot into the Galilee. And his brothers say to him, now look here, you've got to go down to the feast. You've got to go down to Jerusalem because... How will anybody know who you are and how will anything good happen and how will you be important unless you're down there? Do you see the issue of desire, which is going to be the main thing 
together with the water of the Spirit that I talk about. The brothers wanted Jesus to be powerful, not least, I rather suspect, because this rather strange brother of theirs, well, if uh, he became powerful, they were on the way up. And so many of our desires are misshapen. We want power, because power brings wealth. Power brings attraction. Power draws people to us. It puts them at our disposal to be used by us. What do we desire? Well, Jesus says to his brothers, no, no, you go down to the feast. It's not the right time for me. And when he decides it is the right time, a bit later than them, he goes quietly down to the feast, not making a big noise about himself, but he goes to see what's going on, and when he's in the temple, he begins to teach. There's a lot of talk going on about him. You can imagine him walking quietly around the temple. Remember, there was no social media, no television, no photographs, no newspapers. So nobody would really have known what he looked like. So it'd be perfectly easy for him to be invisible in the crowd. And he is for a while. And he hears a divided crowd. People say, <clears throat> where is he? Is he going to show up? Well, where did a man like that, from that area, with that parentage, as though they knew it, get the teaching he teaches? Some people say, oh, he's a good man. Others say, no, 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 he's leading the people astray. He's a cheat. People want to know, they desire to know who Jesus is, who sent him, the authority he has. And in all that, moment by moment, there is a constant threat, a threat of arrest, a threat of death. When I think of South Africa, I know how many of you in all generations have had to live with threats of death, in, with threats of danger, and how bravely you have set an example to the world. To go back to John 7, it's a dramatic scene. Jesus polarizes people. The antagonism intensifies. Even the authorities and their agents are not united in opposing him. And Jesus challenges those who he encounters about what they really want. When he was previously in Jerusalem, he got into trouble for healing a man on the Sabbath. He says to them, you, you carry out religious ritual on the Sabbath, and yet you fuss about a, a man desperately ill, being made well. And the whole drama and division is around the question of the identity of Jesus. And Jesus still divides. Uh, it's something I have to come to terms with for me, the person of Jesus Christ is so extraordinary. I know he loves me. His presence is so precious that I cannot for a moment imagine people hating me because they hate Christ. And yet, all over the world, Christians find that. Even I find that. I'm sure you have. And Jesus comes to the Feast of the Tabernacles and he changes desire. It says in John 7, on the last, on the greatest day of the feast, John 7 verse 37, Jesus stands and cries out, anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from him. 
Well, I put the emphasis on come to me because at the moment he stood up, the high priest was pouring water over the altar. And Jesus said, this is an image of who I am. His claim is overwhelming. My challenge to myself and to you, does Jesus have a space in your life? Or does he have all your life? I ask myself that. What we do is we travel through life set ablaze by the Spirit of God, Anglicans ablaze. As we travel, the fire spreads, the water spreads out, more and more of our lives is touched by Jesus Christ. Never more than we can cope with. Quite often, more than we immediately desire. And then we find when we surrender to Christ, more deeply, day by day by day, our desires are met. This great passage, with its parallels in Ezekiel chapter 47, reflects a key theme in John's Gospel, a theme that runs through the Gospel, desire. Here it reaches a climax. In the Greek original text, the word used comes again and again and again. It's translated variously, but it's about seeking, wanting, searching, desiring. When you seek, you desire. Even at the most basic level, you put your phone down and you can't find it. You seek it because you desire it, you want it. How much more do we seek and desire the presence of Christ? And you will know and I know that feeling, this key image of desire, anyone who is thirsty, come to me, says Jesus, and drink. And that cry distills the double thrust of the desire Jesus seeks. First, that the reader of John might trust and know who Jesus is, and second, that they might live glorifying God. These are the two key points of Jesus' message, the two key points we carry into, wor into the world, people, that people might trust in Jesus and know who he is, and that leads to the lifestyle, to the morality so that they might live glorifying God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 7, that desire is in dramatic conflict, a contrast to the conflict around him. His desire is often in contrast to our own. As we pursue popularity, public success, being widely known and admired, or even as clergy, having a ministry that people admire, that looks successful. Oh, that's a temptation. It's the conflict between seeking the glory of God and the flourishing of people, or of seeking our own glory and power over people. And the passage reveals some more of the things we most desire. Jesus is dismissed by many because he hasn't had the education. He's never been taught, some in the crowd say. Some of the leaders ask, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? He's the rock from the wrong part of the country. Funny accent, you know, that man. By his appearance, verse 24, Jesus says, stop judging by mere appearances and judge correctly and by class. The Pharisees say to the temple guards who were sent to arrest him and were so blown away, set ablaze by his teaching, that they didn't arrest him. But the Pharisees, the leaders say the temple guards, have any of the rulers, the rulers, the big people, the great, have they believed in him? No. How can you then believe in this unimportant man? All these things that the crowds, the Pharisees, everyone except Jesus thought were so important. They are the things 
that we think are important. They distract us. We hope they'll bring us approval, love, popularity, satisfaction. Only Jesus does that when we are filled with the Spirit, set ablaze. He is the way, the truth and the life. He is the only desire that has eternal beauty and perfection. Our lives are formed and shaped and moulded entirely by Jesus, if we let him. If we leave, uh, live a truly Jesus-shaped life, we c it won't just happen once a week on a Sunday morning, it has to seep into every aspect of our lives. We must welcome God into every part of our day, read the scriptures, pray. We must welcome God into our family life, our work, when we travel and however we feel when we're angry or frightened or proud. To, be a, to have a Jesus-shaped life will set us apart. In Peter's first letter to uh, the churches of what is now part of Turkey and Europe, Peter says, once you were not a people, but now you are a people. You've been changed. Being God's people means we strive to live according to God's call, but yet we look outward to let the Spirit flow and fill and overflow into the world around us to be set ablaze. And so what we preach as Christians isn't morality, be good, it's Jesus. Let Jesus rule your desires and goodness and holiness will come in a way you can't imagine. The consequence of following Jesus is a life lived to the glory of God, not success of self. It's a life where our most natural desires are converted. They're not removed, we all face temptation, but they're converted. It's not that we lose all our pleasures. When I first became a Christian, I thought, Oh, everything I like happening's got to, got to go. I can't go to parties, I can't see friends, I can't do the fun stuff. Oh, yes, I can, but with a different heart. All over the world, in every place, people have different desires. The most basic ones are essential. Peace, food, justice, equality. Jesus knows about this. He knows what it is like to live in an unequal, unfair world. He's talking to people living in a war zone occupied by Roman forces, likely in immense poverty. And his answer is, follow me. If we're going to make disciples, we need to know that we're pointing towards Jesus first and foremost. Out of that comes the transformation of desire and the transformation of society. Out of that comes a willingness to give everything, so that as in South Africa 30 years ago, the world may be changed the right way up. I don't want to understate, I don't want certainly to dismiss the enormous pressures that so many people are living in in so many countries around the world whether it's the fragility resulting from the COVID pandemic, or waking in the morning and not having adequate access to safe drinking water, or when one, someone wants a bribe, or when there's obvious injustice, well, those righteous desires, those correct desires for justice are most powerful when they are shaped by a desire for Jesus Christ. Now, I mustn't lecture you. I mustn't tell you what to do. This isn't about me saying what's right, pay attention to me. It's really not about that. I mock myself in it. It's about encouraging you and saying, if you're thirsty, here's the person who will satisfy your thirst, Jesus Christ. Many of you I know will feel a deep sense of profound anger at much of what you see around you. This is a broken world, full of sin and cruelty and injustice. 
it is not the ideal world. The acute need of justice for so many in South Africa, of economic, social justice, justice for women remains strong. And the answer is found not through, re not through violent revolution, not through spears or machetes or guns or clubs. The answer to a world in need of transformation is lives transformed, empowered, given vision, courage, strength to protest, lives made living banners to the justice of God, living torches to the justice of God. Anglicans ablaze. It's not fun. Struggle is difficult, when, especially when the problem's so urgent, so painful. But to drink from the deep water, to be anointed by it, to be blessed by it, refreshed by it, will change you, and it will change the world. Not through quietism, but through voices raised in passionate commitment to what is right and good in the power of Christ, not in hatred. When that happens, our lives will be, as it says in Paul's epistle, epistle to the Galatians, full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When that happens, people will know that you are the people of God, whether it's as in South Africa, whether it's as in so many countries around the world where injustice seems to rule. They will know that you are the people of God and many will be inspired not only to justice but to quench their own thirst with the water of Christ. And in so doing, we will see the growth of a life and love and light and freedom in Jesus Christ. I am so grateful to be able to speak to you. I long to see you again. May God bless you.